Hi, Dr. Crowder here, and this video is a brief summary of recessive suppression, which is a type of genetic interaction between two genes. More specifically, a recessive suppression interaction is an interaction between two genes when you cross a double heterozygous individual to another double heterozygous individual, you see a 13 to 3 phenotype ratio, or 13 to 3 phenotype ratio in the F2 progeny. The interaction of recessive suppression results from what we call a suppressor mutation in one gene. And a suppressor mutation is a mutation in a gene that reverses the phenotype of the mutation in another gene so that the phenotype is wild type. Um, usually the suppressor mutation, so a suppressor mutation in a gene on its own, so a homozygous recessive individual with the suppressor mutation would not present any phenotype. So again, recessive suppression is an interaction between two genes where one of those genes has a mutation that we call a suppressor mutation and we see a 13 to 3 phenotype ratio in F2 generation. So let's think of an example to explore the idea of recessive suppression. And for this, we're going to turn to Drosophila melanogaster, or fruit flies, which is a favorite genetic model organism. And we are going to consider the gene purple, where flies that are wild type for purple, or the wild type phenotype is red eyes, as you can see here in this fly, uh, red eyes, and we are wild type for the purple gene. If you are homozygous mutant for the purple gene, you have purple eyes. And the mutant allele of purple is recessive to the wild type allele. The wild type purple gene is involved in pigment synthesis. And we can look at this biochemical pathway where you have a purple pigment precursor that is then converted into red pigment. And the conversion from purple pigment to red pigment is carried out by the protein product, the enzymatic product of the wild type purple gene. So if you are mutant for the purple gene and you don't produce a functional gene product, then the purple pigment precursor will not be converted into the red pigment and therefore you will have flies with purple eyes. So now that we understand what a mutation in the purple gene will result in, let's consider a second mutation in a, another unlinked gene. And the nature of this mutation was a suppressor mutant as we defined earlier, a suppressor mutation is a mutation that on its own doesn't necessarily elicit a phenotype. However, if an organism is mutant for both the suppressor mutation and the purple mutation, that individual that's a double homozygous mutant would actually have the wild type phenotype because the suppressor mutant suppresses the phenotype of the purple mutant. So in this case, an organism that is wild type for both the purple gene and the gene that the suppressor mutant occurs in would have red eyes or the wild type phenotype. Similarly, an organism that is wild type for the purple gene but homozygous recessive for the suppressor mutant, so homozygous for the suppressor mutation, this organism would still have wild type eye color. Because again, the suppressor mutation on its own does not elicit a mutation phenotype. Now an organism that is homozygous recessive for a mutation in the purple gene, but wild type for the suppressor gene, will, as expected, have purple eyes. Because again, there's no functional product produced from gene P that would function to convert the purple pigment to red pigment, leading to purple eyes. Now, let's consider a fly that is homozygous mutant for the purple gene. So in this fly, no functional gene product is made from the purple gene, so the purple pigment is not converted into the red pigment. Based on that alone, you would hypothesize that the fly would have purple eyes. However, this particular fly is also homozygous mutant for the suppressor mutation. And based on the recessive suppression interaction, that means that this second mutation in another unlinked gene suppresses the phenotype of the mutation in the purple gene, making it such that 
the fly displays the wild type phenotype. In this case would be red eyes. Now this second mutation, this suppressor mutation, at a molecular level can act to suppress the mutation of the purple gene through various mechanisms. And there are several ways that a suppressor mutant or a mutant in another gene can reverse the mutant phenotype of another gene back to wild type. So let's now walk through how this might play out in uh, crosses and in the progeny uh, phenotype ratios we would expect to see. Where in this cross, we are crossing a wild type fly, a fly that is homozygous wild type for the purple gene, but homozygous mutant for the suppressor mutation. And we're crossing that to a fly that is homozygous mutant for the purple gene, but homozygous wild type for the suppressor mutant. And as we discussed before, the suppressor mutant on its own has no phenotype. So this fly would be wild type or have red eyes. And the fly that is homozygous mutant for the purple gene will have purple eyes. The F1 of this cross would be heterozygous for both the purple mutation and heterozygous for the suppressor mutation. And so these flies would be wild type. Now let's say we took two F1 flies, a male fly and a female fly. Both are heterozygous for both the purple mutation and the suppressor mutation. We cross those flies. This is what we would expect the progeny genotypes to be of that cross. We're here in this top row. I've written out all of the possible gamete combinations from one parent of crossing F1s. So these are the possible gametes that would be produced from one of the heterozygous and then the same possible gametes produced from the other. And then we fill out our Punnett square for all of the possible F2 progeny phenotypes. So now we can walk through and assign phenotypes to all of these different progeny. So first we've got wild type purple, homozygous wild type for the purple gene, homozygous wild type for the suppressor, so that would be red. So anytime we see at least one copy of the wild type purple gene, we know that that fly will have red eyes or be phenotypically wild type because one copy of the purple gene is sufficient to have function converting the purple pigment to the red pigment. And we remember that the suppressor mutation on its own does not have a phenotype. Now what about progeny that are homozygous mutant for the purple? So in this one, this is homozygous mutant for the purple, so the purple gene product is not made, or a functional product is not made, so purple pigment is not converted to red, so homozygous for the wild type suppressor, so no effect on the mutant purple gene product that is a purple-eyed fly. Similarly here, no purple gene product is made. We've got one wild type copy of the suppressor gene. Similar for here. Now, in this double mutant, this fly is also homozygous mutant for the suppressor mutation, which would reverse the phenotype of the purple mutation, causing this fly, the double mutant, to be red or phenotypically wild type. So if we count up all of the red flies, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 red flies. And if we count up all of the purple flies, we see 1, 2, 3 purple flies. And so that is how the recessive suppression gene interaction between two genes, between one mutant gene and a suppressor mutation, leads to a 13 to 3 ratio in the F2 from crossing uh, two heterozygotes. Again, because in the double homozygous mutant, the suppressor mutation, being homozygous for the suppressor mutation, reverses the phenotype of the mutant of the other gene so that the organism displays a wild type phenotype. So I hope that this video was helpful 
in helping you to learn a bit more about uh, gene interactions and specifically looking at uh, the gene interaction of recessive suppression.